Good evening, everyone. It's always such a humbling experience to come together with Master's large worldwide family to share his most profound and practical teachings. He has brought us that eternal truth, that truth that never changes. But for this age, he has brought to us that truth in a very understandable way, a very practical approach to living the spiritual life and to living life in this world. In referring to the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, Guruji talked about the two greatest laws or truths that were given to mankind in order to live a happy, productive, and successful life. Guruji said, learn to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. You do not need any other commandments if you follow those two. Very simple, isn't it? Just have to follow those two commandments. On another occasion when he was talking about these two greatest commandments, he said, these two commandments sum up the whole purpose of religion to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And Guruji has brought to us the science of yoga whereby we can learn to give our full attention and our hearts and our minds, all of our strength to seek God and to feel God within. And then the second commandment is like the first, to love our neighbor as ourself. And actually, these two commandments work hand in hand because you cannot separate them. You cannot truly love other people unless you love God. And we cannot truly love God unless we love other people. Because as we know in Master's teachings, it has been brought to your attention throughout this week, is that God lives in each one of us. And that's the whole purpose, is to see God within ourselves and then to see God in one another. So this evening, we're going to be talking about the second commandment, to love your neighbor, to love one another. So very important in the spiritual path and in life. There was a, there's an American who grew up. He was born in India. He immigrated to the United States when he was a, a young man. And he uh, became a, uh, an author, a novelist, and also a professor at Rutgers University. And he said that when he was younger, people used to ask him whether he felt more as an American or more as an Indian. And he said if it was an Indian asking him, he'd say, I feel more like I'm an American. <laughs> and if it was an American asking him, he would say, I feel more like I'm an Indian. And you know why he, he did this? He said, I did this because I wanted to bother people. <laughs> Not a very inspiring philosophy to live by, is it? You know, your, your main purpose in life is to bother other people. But he said that when he was growing up, he was very unsettled, he was unhappy, he had many physical difficulties, he was in the hospital a lot, and he said he wanted to grab as much happiness as he could for himself. And so he said, as I grew up, I was feeling desperate, having the sense that there was only a limited amount of happiness in the world, and I had to grab whatever I could. In my 30s, after decades of being hurt and angry, I decided I couldn't go on this way. I had to change. I had to change in a very dramatic way. 
So he thought to himself, I need to start thinking of other people more than just myself. So one day he was in his uh, uh, apartment building and he was coming down the elevator and a woman got into the elevator with him. And so he wanted to try this new philosophy. So he asked her uh, how she was doing. And she said, not well. And he thought to himself, I have my own problems. <laughs> so he thought it was, you know, the polite thing to say was, well, what's the matter? And she said, well, my son is a paranoid schizophrenic. Um, I have to put him into the hospital today, and it's been very painful for me. And then this man said, at that moment, the thing I felt the most was annoyance. He said, I have my own problems. In my heart of hearts, I knew that she had a problem, but I wanted to get back to thinking about myself. <laughs> so he said, I did, but I decided to ask her, would you like me to go to the hospital with you? I asked this because he decided that it was a way to start thinking a little bit about other people. And, but he said, as I asked this, though, I thought, please, God, say no. <laughs> and the woman said, yes. <laughs> she said, thank you, that would be great. And then this man said, unexpectedly, I felt enormous relief. It was as if space opened up around me. He said, every time I have given help to those who were in need, he said, I have had that same sensation, sometimes not immediately, sometimes later, but a great space that would open up around me. He said, it is generosity which reminds us we are more than our problems. The easiest way to feel safe is to offer patience, to offer help. When we do this, we're forced to step out of ourselves and we're reminded that the world is greater than our imagination. So this man was putting into practice a law of God. He was stepping in, as Master said, into Christ consciousness by forgetting himself and helping somebody else. This is a law of God. This is what God expects of each one of us in order to live happy lives. You know, our guru has given us so much in his lectures, in his writings, so much profundity, so much pragmatic wisdom. But even in addition to that, through his life itself, his life as a scripture, a walking, talking scripture. And even though Master is an avatar, he had that liberation long ago, he comes back from that vast, omnipresent consciousness and he's informed into a small body and he plays a role on earth. And he goes through all of these human experiences to teach us, through the example of his own life, how to live. In his very humble way, Guruji said when I was very little, he said when I saw somebody playing with something, he said, I wanted that. He said, but soon I found that whenever I wanted something, there was always somebody else that wanted to get it too. So he said, I began to exert my strong will to possess what I wanted. And we know Master had a very strong will, <laughs> even as a little boy. He said, but when this brought about fights with others, I wondered if this was the right attitude to assume. And then he said his mother, whenever his mother would give him some special treat of food, she would say, share this with somebody else. And Guruji said, initially my, reac my reaction was she was trying to give me less <laughs> to share it with somebody else. But he said, but immediately I began to picture in my mind, well, if I like this food so much, maybe somebody else would like it too. So I decided... I would share. Then came the thought, if I share with everybody, there will be nothing at all left for me. <laughs> that began to puzzle me. You know, follow Master's reasoning, you know. He's, he's doing this to 
instruct us through his own life. He said, but my experience was that if I shared with others, then I enjoyed more. The joy received from sharing was even greater than the joy I got from the thing I had shared. He's putting into practice this cosmic law of sharing, of being selfless. He said when he was in college one time, he and a, uh, another college student went to the market. He wanted to buy some pineapples. He said there was only two. And Master bought both of them. One was bigger than the other. And he gave the bigger pineapple to his friend, which surprised his friend. He thought that Master was going to keep that, the bigger pineapple for himself. Guruji said, a wonderful feeling arises within a person when he is considerate of others, thinking first of them. As soon as you are concerned for someone else, not only does he think of you, but God thinks of you too. Remember that. Make note of that. Guruji said, as soon as you are concerned for someone else, not only does he think of you, but God thinks of you too. We can never be happy by trying to hoard, by trying to keep for ourselves because we are not these bodies. We are not these minds. Guruji said, infinity is our home. Infinity is our home. This is not our home. He said, we are just sojourning a while in the caravansary of the body. We are here for just a short time. We are not these bodies. And the more we can expand our consciousness away from just I, me, and mine, we don't feel less joy, we feel more joy. And as somebody said, the service we render to others is really the rent we pay for our room on this earth. It is obvious that man is himself a traveler, that the purpose of this world is not to have and to hold, but to give and serve. There can be no other meaning. Not to have and to hold, but to give and to serve. Lord Krishna was instructing his disciple Arjuna in this famous uh, stanza or sloka from the Bhagavad Gita. He says, O oh, Arjuna, the best type of yogi is he who feels for others, whether in grief or pleasure, even as he feels for himself. We are all yogis. We are all united. We are all one. When somebody else is going through a difficult time or they're hurt, it affects us. Whenever we can reach out and help another individual, we are helping our larger self. Master said, a person identified with the body feels his pain and happiness as his own. A yogi who is one with God knows the cosmos to be his own body. Feeling the afflictions and joys of all beings as his own, he tries to decrease their suffering and to increase their happiness. And Guruji goes on to say that we don't have to uh, love everybody in the world. You know, we love your neighbor as yourself. Who is our neighbor? Master said, our neighbor is anybody who crosses our path in our daily lives. That is our neighbor. And oftentimes, it is through affliction, through tests and trials in life, that it forces us out of just ourself to think about other people. Because Master said, there's two ways to learn, wisdom and experience. We have to go through sometimes the hard knocks through suffering in order to feel for others. Most of you are probably familiar with the uh, Olympian swimmer, the Olympic swimmer, Michael Phelps. He was the most decorated swimmer in Olympic history. He won something like 28 medals, 23 of them gold medals. And, you know, here he was, you know, on top of the world, but while he was going through these experiences, he said that he was going through a deep 
dark depression. And he has suicidal thoughts. And he locked himself into a room one day for several days. It was so deep and so dark. And then finally, at the end of a few days, he decided he needed to get some help. So he got help. He went to, through some therapy. And then he began to help other people by telling his own story. And he said, whenever I would help somebody else with my story, he said, those moments and those feelings and those emotions for me are light years better than ever winning an Olympic gold medal. You have the chance to save a life, and that's way more powerful. Here's one of the greatest swimmer of all time, on top of the world, but it didn't give him the satisfaction or the fulfillment because anything in this material world, whether it's fame or, or money or possessions, cannot give us that. But when we reach out and we can help another person, we are touching God. We are helping God in that form. And he said when question whether he would change anything that he had to go through in his life. And he said, you know, some of those experiences have been absolutely miserable and brutal and haven't been the funnest experiences to go through. But they've made me who I am today and they have really helped me to grow as a person. So he went through those difficult ex experiences and it opened up his heart it opened up his mind, and he began to help other people. Guruji said, as your range of experience begins to increase, you begin to stretch your consciousness, which is expandable like rubber and will never break. As soon as you begin to do something for somebody else, then you are no longer completely selfish. You are taking a step toward Christ consciousness. When you really do something for someone else without any thought of using that person for your own selfish ends or desires, then you have momentarily stepped into Christ consciousness. It's not only meditation. It's right activity. It's service. It's selfless service. You know that legend of King Arthur and when he was a, a young man, the old king had died, and the ruling powers were trying to decide how to choose the next king. And right at that time, they found this large rock, and there was a sword embedded into the rock with just the hilt sticking out of the rock. And so the ruling powers deemed it that whoever could remove that sword from the stone would become the next king. So all the knights in the land came and they tugged and tugged and pulled. Nobody could remove that sword. And Arthur, who was a young man, he was helping as a second or as an assistant to another knight during a duel. And the knight that he was serving broke his sword. And Arthur remembered that sword that was embedded in the stone. So he ran to where that stone was and he just easily pulled the sword from the stone. He ran and he gave it to the knight. Through that selfless act of service for somebody else, Arthur inherited the kingdom. And you think about it, when we perform selfless acts, we are also preparing ourselves for a greater kingdom, the kingdom of God. So we've talked about an athlete talked about a, um, a fairy tale or a legend. And now there's a great scientist, one of the greatest scientists of the 20th century, Albert Einstein, who made some great deep discoveries in the 20th century. He said, a human being is a part of a whole called by us the universe, a part limited in time and space. Time and space being part of maya or delusion. He said he experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings, as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion 
is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest us. Einstein goes on to say, our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature and its beauty. This is coming from a scientist. Isn't that beautiful? He realized that we are in this, under this delusion or this illusion of maya. It's a prison. And the way to get out of this prison, besides meditation, is selfless service of thinking of other people. Dayama was a, a beautiful example of this. You know, she wanted to just be a bhakti yogi, just loving God. The master told her that she had to be a karma yogi. She had to work. She had to serve. But she combined those two, that, that bhakti and that karma yogi, to serve other people. She spent her whole life serving others, to serve this work, to build this work, make this a strong foundation for this work to grow and to spread throughout the world. And as Brother Jayananda was saying on Sunday night, Dayama was a very, very practical person. Her head was in the clouds of God realization, but her feet were firmly planted on the ground. One time she said, it is marvelous to speak of love. It is another matter to be able to put it into practice. And then she was talking about some notes that she had uh, from one of Master's talks, where Master said, the Upanishads say, he who feels all beings as existing in the Atman, the soul, and also that the Atman exists in all beings, does not feel any hatred, does not speak ill of anyone, and does not want to hide himself for fear. If we realize that all beings are parts of the same God of whom we are also a part, if we realize that God resides in all beings and empowers their acts from within, we cannot hate or speak ill or fear any other being. It's a very practical thing. And then Ma says, consider how we can apply these truths in our lives. She says, she says, are we thoughtful of other people? Do I take the most for myself? Or do I leave the best for other people? Do I take the least? And she said, it's a wonderful feeling to be the least, to take the least. She said, I tell you truthfully from experience, there is much joy in the consciousness of feeling oneself to be the least and much joy in being unselfish because that is the way God is. And then she said, Master taught us by example. She said he was the most appreciative person. When anybody did anything for him, he was so thankful, so appreciative. Master often said, as you are so kind and loving toward me, be kind and loving toward all. This is the attitude that God wants to see, for he is present even in the least among us. The more we lose ourselves in thinking of others, the more God will regard us. Again, when we do for others, not only do they think of us, but God thinks of us too. Uh, last night, Brother Sevananda told a story about St. Therese of Lisieux, the little flower. I'm glad he didn't use my story. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of stories about St. Therese of Lisieux. She was the little flower, but she was a powerful soul. She had a, an iron will, and she was always thinking of others, always putting herself last. And the story that Brother Sevananda told was about a, a young nun who was not easy to get along with, and she really reached out to her. And this story is about an elderly nun. Her name was Sister St. Peter, and she was a, an invalid, and she needed to be helped around. And she was also very difficult to get along with. So you see, even in convents and monasteries, it's not all angels with wings. <laughs> and so 
this elderly nun needed help to go from the chapel when they had prayer and meditation to their fractory. And so Therese would have to lead her 10 minutes before the meditation ended into the refectory. So she would get her up out of her seat and she would very carefully walk behind her and try to guide her. And the nun would say, where are you? Where are you? I don't feel you. And then Therese would hold on to her and she said, then she'd say, you're going too fast. You're going too fast. Slow down. And she'd say, I knew that you were too young to take care of me. And bitterly, criticizing her again and again. And Therese was just doing everything she could to comfort this elderly nun. So they made it to the refectory. She sat her down on the bench. She rolled up her sleeves. And then her duty was done, but she thought, well, she's having a hard time cutting her bread. So Therese would help her slice her, cut her bread a little bit. And then she gave her her most splendid smile. Therese said, she never expressed any wish that I should do so, but the unexpected kindness touched her greatly. Through it, as I learned later, and still more by bestowing on her my sweetest smile, at the end of my task, I won her entire confidence. And then Therese goes on to say, to talk about another experience she had with this elderly nun, one cold winter's night. She was guiding this nun down through the cold, dark corridors of the convent. And she said, Suddenly there fell upon my ears the harmonious strains of distant music. A picture rose before me of a richly furnished room, brilliantly lighted and decorated, and full of elegantly dressed young girls conversing together, as is the way of the world. Then I turned to the poor invalid. Instead of sweet music, I heard her complaints. Instead of rich gilding, I saw the bare brick walls of our cloister scarcely visible in the dim, flickering light. And then Therese said, The contrast thrilled me. And our Lord so illumined my soul with the rays of his truth, in the light of which the pleasures of the world are but darkness, that not for a thousand years of such worldly delights would I have bartered the ten minutes spent in my act of charity. Another beautiful example of a great saint. Not a thousand years of worldly delights. She would not barter those, she would not exchange those ten minutes spent in charity. And then she was thinking of the words of, of Jesus that if you, as long as you did it to one of these, my least brethren, you did it to myself. And again, she was doing this for her guru, for Jesus. Guruji said, the way to freedom is through service to others. The way to happiness is through meditation and being in tune with God. So we have that twofold aspect of our lives. The way to freedom is through service to others. The way to happiness is through meditation and being in tune with God. One time, one of the disciples was doing some special work for the guru with a very willing and devoted attitude And Guruji said, you see how good it is to work for the Lord? The sense of egotism or selfishness within us is a test. The sense of egotism or selfishness within us is a test. Because when we have that egotism and that selfishness, then we are limiting ourselves in the prison again. And we are not these bodies. We are... Will we wisely labor for the Heavenly Father or foolishly for ourselves? By performing actions in the right spirit, Master said, we come to understand that the Lord is the only doer, that is, all power is divine and flows from the soul being God. Getting outside of ourselves, realizing that God is the doer.
It brings such, such joy to us. We know that. You all know that. When you do something for somebody else, it brings a happiness, a sense of freedom. There's a story about a young college man. His name was Paul. And his brother, his older brother, gave him a pre-Christmas present of a brand new shiny car. And so one day he came out of his, where he was living and there was this little boy, a little street urchin, was wa- walking around the car and just admiring it. And uh, he asked the, the man, Paul, about the car. And he said, uh, he said, boy, where did you get that? And he said, well, my brother gave it to me. He says, wow. He said, you mean you didn't pay for any of it at all? He said, no, my brother gave it to me. So then he was, the little boy was saying, I wish, and then he stopped and, and Paul knew that the little boy was thinking, I wish that, you know, uh, I had a brother like that. But the boy said, I wish that I could be a brother like that. <laughs> and then Paul looked at the little boy and said, would you like to take a ride in my, in my car? And he says, oh yes, I'd love that. So they were driving around and he said, would you mind if we drove by my house? And, And Paul was thinking, well, yeah, he just wants to show off that he's riding around in a really big fancy car. So they went by the street where his house was, and he said, could you stop here? And he ran up these little steps, and he came down the stairs, and he was carrying his little brother who was handicapped with polio. He couldn't walk. He was crippled. And so he sat down with his little brother on the steps, and he got up right next to him, and he said, There she is, Bobby, just like I told you upstairs. His brother gave it to him for Christmas, and it didn't cost him a cent. And someday I'm going to give you one just like that. Then you can see for yourself all the pretty things in the Christmas windows that I've been trying to tell you about. And then Paul realized that this little boy, he wasn't thinking about himself. He was thinking that, boy, if I could be a brother like that and give... It's more blessed to give than to receive. Master said, make up your mind to be of service to someone every day. You can often help others just by giving them a little understanding. See God in everyone as I see him. This is why Master could be so loving and so humble. Because he saw God in everybody, regardless of the outer circumstances, the outer covering. See God in everyone as I see him. Do not ridicule an erring person. God is sleeping in that soul, and you must lovingly awaken him. Mentally put yourself in the position of others, and then with the utmost kindness, you will be able to understand and help them. There is no greater joy. We have to look beneath the surface. I, you know, I love to sit in the back of the hall and see all the devotees coming in, and I mentioned to one of the monks the other night, I said, boy, Master sure has drawn a diverse crowd of souls, hasn't he? We're all so different, yet we're all the same. We all have that, that soul quality, that, that essence of spirit within us, and that desire to express it. There was a woman who was shelling um, lima beans, and as she was you know, going through the, the uh, pods, she came across some old dried-up ones, and she would throw them in the trash. And then she thought, well, let me take a look inside. So she opened up one of the dried-up pods, and she saw beautifully formed lima beans inside. And then she said, sometimes we dismiss people whose covers don't please us. Get to know the goodness of people under the not-so-promising shell, the superficial aspects. Goethe, the great German statesman and writer, once said, treat people as if they were what they ought to be, and you help them to become what they are capable of being. And his mother said, I always seek the good that is in people and leave the bad to him who made that mankind and knows how to round off the corners. We all have a few corners to rub off, I think. 
And we shouldn't be surprised at meeting all different kinds of people every day. When you leave your home and you go and you, you say to yourself, okay, today I'm going to be meeting from some very challenging people and challenging conditions, as Brother Savannah was talking about last night, seeing God in all people and all conditions. So you say to yourself, I am going to be meeting people today who talk too much, people who are selfish, egotistical, ungrateful, but I won't be surprised or disturbed, for I can't imagine a world without such people. <laughs> we have to prepare ourselves, right? Somebody said, some people cause happiness wherever they go. Others, whenever they go. So we have to ask ourselves, which type of person am I? In the, one of the Jewish scriptures, the Talmud, it says, Do not unto others that which is hateful to you. This is the whole of the law. All the rest is commentary. Think about that. Do not unto others that which is hateful to you. Because whenever we do something, it comes back to us. That's the law of karma. The same God in that individual is in me too. Do not unto others that which is harmful or hurtful to you. You think about a group like this, this week that we have here, and all the devotees that come from around the world, all of the volunteers that have worked, some of them throughout the year, coordinating and planning this event to make it run smoothly. And why do people do this? Why take a week off to serve and to work too? Because it brings such joy that we serve one another. It's the most inspiring example to see that, to see how our devotees serve in our temples and our centers and their groups and circles and a convocation, and it's one large spiritual family coming together to serve one another, to see God in one another. Master said, recognizing the God love burning in all heart lamps, you will see and feel only God love flowing through everybody and everything. Never neglect to do what you can for yourself in the form of others. To know spirit, you must become the spirit and find yourself as manifested through the bodies and minds of others. Break the boundaries of selfishness and include in it all beings and universes, everything. This is part of our sadhana, along with our meditation techniques, our devotion is serving, seeing our larger self in others forgetting ourselves, taking the least, being the last, so forth. The next point I want to discuss is very important in understanding others, in living in harmony, and that is the idea of learning to listen. Really learning to listen to people. One of the greatest ways we can treat other people, one of the greatest gifts, is to be present and to listen to people, not just with our ears, but with our eyes, our minds, our hearts, and our souls. One psychotherapist said, to be in the present with someone else is a gift. The gift of attention is perhaps the most precious and envied of all, even though we do not always realize it, to be there, to be totally available. And this has to come, this has to be very genuine, very sincere, to be with other people. It is such a gift, not to be analyzing or to be thinking about what I'm going to respond or the advice I'm going to give them, but to listen, to have empathy, is such a great gift. 
One of the greatest examples of this art of listening to me was Brother Anandamoy, one of the, the best counselors. He was my counselor for over 30 years, and I went to him often, and he very rarely would give me advice. He would listen. And when he listened, he was there with his whole being. He wasn't distracted by anything else. He gave me his full attention, and I, feel, I felt valued. I felt loved. And so, brother used to give homework assignments to all of you during convocation. And I give you a homework assignment to when you go home or during this week, seek out people and listen to them. Give your whole heart and soul to listen. But it has to be done with genuineness, with sincerity. A little girl was sent on an errand by her mother. She got back late, and her mother demanded an explanation. Why are you late? And she said, well, my little friend, her doll broke. And the mother said, oh, so you stopped to help her fix her doll. And she said, no, I stopped to help her cry. That's the empathy. That's the feeling. One of the previous presidents in America was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He was known as FDR, and he had many receptions at the White House. But after a time, he, he was having doubt whether people really listened to him. So he wanted to test it out. So one day, after a reception in the White House, as people were leaving, FDR was there, and he flashed a big smile, and he put out his hand, extended his hand, and he said, he said to them, I murdered my grandmother this morning. People responded, oh, how lovely. <laughs> Another person said, well, just continue with your great work. <laughs> and then there was one foreign diplomat, and as he walked out, he responded softly, I'm sure she had it coming to her. <laughs> Guruji was so practical and so balanced. Listen to what he said. When you feel like being alone, get away from people. Be by yourself. Do not keep company with people unless you are prepared to give them your full attention. In that regard, when I am with others, I mix with concentration, with attention, with love. When I am alone, I am alone with God. This is the way we should be when we are with others. We give them our full attention. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, who is now St. Teresa, said, Let no one ever come to you without leaving better and happier. Be the living expression of God's kindness, kindness in your face, kindness in your eyes, kindness in your smile. She said, the biggest disease today is not tuberculosis or leprosy, but rather the feeling of being unwanted, of loneliness. That is the biggest disease. She found when she traveled the world that there was so much poverty and disease in India and Calcutta, but when she went to more civilized places like New York, she found the disease of loneliness. People were lonely. She said, there are many in the world who are dying for a piece of bread, but there are many more dying for a little love. And then another extremely important quality or attribute when we talk about spiritual generosity, being selfless, is the idea of forgiveness. Forgiveness. Master said, you must love people. Sometimes it is hard, I know. I have loved my enemies, and I know I shall never be an enemy to anyone. By a thought, I could destroy them, but I have never done it, and I 
shall never do it. The desire and strength to forgive come from attunement with God. So many people, I talk to people at our temples and on tours, and they hold on to grudges or resentment of things that have been done to them or said to them. We need to learn to forgive. Robert Browning, the poet, said, good to forgive, best to forget. We must forgive and forget. It's a burden on our minds to hold on to these things. When Jesus was asked by Peter, how many times should I forgive? Seven times? He said, no, 70 times seven. Abraham Lincoln, one of the greatest leaders in American history, when he was a young lawyer, he was asked to be part of a team on a case. And when he got there, these other lawyers eschewed him. They pushed him aside. They ostracized him. In fact, one of the lawyers said, I don't want this gawky ape around. He insulted Lincoln. But Lincoln heard this man. His name was Edwin Stanton. He heard his argument in this case, and he said, it was brilliant. And he said, from that, that example, he said, I went home and I started to study law all over again. Many years passed. Lincoln ran for office. He was the president. And then he needed to find a secretary of war. And he picked Edwin Stanton. And his advisor said, but don't you know that he's your enemy? He calls you names. And he says, yes, but he's brilliant. He's the best man for the job. Lincoln didn't hold on to any resentment. And then on his deathbed, when Stanton was standing there, he looked at Lincoln and he said, now he is for the ages. Lincoln never held on to any grudges. He learned to forgive. And we can learn from little children too. You know, as such of the kingdom of God, like little children. There was a little nine-year-old boy who got a brand new bicycle for Christmas and he would ride it every day. He loved his bike. And then one day he came out and his, he saw this man loading the bike into a car. And he started to run after the car. He says, wait, wait, that's my bike. And the man drove off. But this is a, a very spiritual little boy. And so he had his parents ride on a big poster board and put on a sawhorse in the front lawn of their house. And he said, to the person who stole my bike, you really hurt my feelings when you took my bike. But I am a Christian, and because Jesus forgave me, I forgive you. The next day, the bike was back with a brand new fork and a new paint job. The man had brought the bike back to the little boy. And then, speaking about forgiveness, we need to learn to forgive ourselves. We all make mistakes. Nobody is perfect. We fall. We pick ourselves up. Diamataji was so compassionate about that. She said, God does forgive us our errors. The simplest course is to go directly to God. He is the one from whom we can obtain true forgiveness. Do not dwell too much on your mistakes. That is more hurtful than helpful. So we learn to forgive others. We learn to forgive ourselves because the same God is in all of us. And then we cannot talk about spiritual generosity and giving without talking about the guru. Because the guru is our nearest and dearest friend. He is the one that has come down from omnipresence to shepherd each one of us back to our home in God. And he said, I will come again and again as long as there is one stray brother left behind. Master said, through sympathy and deep vision, a true guru sees the Lord suffering in the physically, mentally, and spiritually poor. And that is why he feels it is his joyous duty to assist them. 
He tries to feed the hungry God in the destitute, to stir the sleeping God in the ignorant, to love the unconscious God in the enemy, and to waken the half-asleep God in the yearning devotee. And by a gentle touch of love, he instantaneously arouses the almost fully awakened God in the advanced seeker. A guru is, among all men, the best of givers. His generosity, like that of the Lord himself, knows no boundaries. We have the greatest gift in the guru. The beautiful thing is, is that, as Shankar has said, you know, a philosopher's stone can only turn iron into gold. It can't turn a philosopher's stone into another philosopher's stone. But the guru can turn his disciples into what he is. So we become like the guru. And if we want to live in attunement with guru and God, then we have to be like him. We have to have that sympathy and that empathy and that caring and that giving that the guru has shown to each one of us, drawing each one of us to this path. So, in summary, unselfishness is required. Forgetting ourselves, not I, me, and mine, but thinking of others, because when we think of others, they think of us and God thinks of us. Learn to listen to people. Have that understanding, that empathy to really listen. Forgiveness, forgiving others, forgiving ourselves. That is spiritual generosity. So I would like to close the class by reading this whisper of Guruji's from Whispers from Eternity. If you'll close your eyes and listen to this beautiful whisper from Master. Heavenly Father, inspired us with generosity. Thy being is an outpouring of bounty. Let us too know the joy of giving. Teach us to spend for others' necessities as naturally as for our own. Since we shudder at even the thought of destitution for ourselves, may we sympathetically help those who in actuality know the pangs of want. Let us realize that to die rich without having shared our treasures is to die poor in thine eyes. And to die poor because of liberality is to die rich with thy blessings. Men selfishly blinded by opulence must experience poverty in this or a future earth life because in the abodes of the world abandoned they saw thee not. And all experiences of thy children it is thine omnipresent consciousness that enjoys and suffers. Thou didst bestow riches on thyself in the forms of the wealthy as an intricate human test to see how charitable thou wouldst be to thyself in the forms of the needy. The large-hearted man receiving from thee loving largesse and freely bestowing it on others expands into the universal self. Accepting daily thine endless gifts, may we praise thee and thank thee, O giver of all. Jai Guru, Jai Ma.